frown and I tried to leave when I smelled the mold, but I looked down and a girl pulled me in my finger and she pulled me into the room where she slept. And I knew it was her bedroom because she pointed to a My Little Pony poster, but that exact moment I looked down on the floor where her feet were and I saw the moldy mattress that she slept on. When I tell people that story, they have cortisol is now in your veins. And I, and I can't leave it. I got to tell you, I gave them a new roof. I want to let you know. I gave them a new roof. It was the first roof I ever gave. I didn't want to, but I couldn't not do it. How's it going? It's Tim Brown, and this is the Hook Better Leads podcast. And today I have Charles Antis of Antis Roofing on. How you doing, man? I'm great, man. Happy to be here. I like the branded background. It's looking fly. I actually like noted that particular design on your guys' social media. I was like, this is clean. I like this. This guy's got a good look. We got a good team here who knows how to tell the story, whether it's words or pictures. I love it very much. We're going to talk about how to use your story in marketing. And I want to ask you a question that's going to, I want to hear a little bit of your story first. So what is a story where you tried so hard and failed, but now figured it out? Huh. Well, <clears throat> I'm, you know, we started our conversation around the trade of roofing, so I should stick to that. I mean, when I started in roofing, I didn't choose this career. I, I landed in California and I found myself without a job. Growing up in Oregon, working with my hands, every man I knew either worked in the forest and the logging camps or in the lumber mills. So I, I fancied myself a laborer and I looked for the only labor job I could find and it was in roofing. And in the profession of roofing in that first year, I didn't love tearing off roofs. You know, although it was kind of fun showing off our strength up there on that roof, at the same time, I, what I loved is when I discovered if somebody had a leak and I could solve it. And the way I discovered that is my, my boss at the company I worked for sent me on a roof repair. And I remember I pulled open some coping metal that was on a slant and I looked under it and I saw this, this obvious dry rot. And I was so happy. I patched it up and I was so anxious to show him how great I am at solving the leak. And I put it all back together. And when he came up on the roof the next day, he pointed out and he said, that's going to leak again. I said, no, it's not why. I mean, I put it, I did it, I, I found it. This is what it was. And he said, Charles, when you put it back together, you put it back together backwards. You put the top piece of coping on first and you put the bottom piece on after and now it's bucking water. <laughs> and then that was when I, I learned the first principle of waterproofing and that is so simple, but it's this. Everything above must, must overlap everything below, just like the feathers on a duck's back. And if I had a mascot, I learned from this guy because he told this story. I learned later, I said, if I had a mascot, but he would tell the story about flashing, roofing, walls. Everything must cascade down just like the feathers on a duck's back. And that's what I really learned, what I love to do in solving leaks, keeping families safe and dry to this day fulfills me. Yeah, and you know, like 80, 90% of the people listening or watching this will be roofers, just so you know, and I, and I love that story. I wanna ask as well, like, why is failure so interesting to people? Because I think failure is a great element of a story, right? Like, why is failure, because you said this in your talk at Best of Success, it's awesome that you spoke there. You said something about, you know, a story about failure is always interesting. Why is failure interesting to people? Well, we, we can't assimilate data. Our cognitive minds think that we can, but our animal brains that rule our decision-making, it can only assimilate story. That is my experience in the world uh, in relation to your experience in the world. And, and, and what causes, what happens is, if I tell you something that has no peril, you can't follow it because you have no way to assimilate. But when I tell you about the time when I walked in, after I told when I told uh, people, give me the leak that no one else can solve and I'll fix it for free. And, and when I showed up at that door and the woman answered the door and instead of smiling, she had this frown and I tried to leave when I smelled the mold, but I looked down and a girl pulled me in my finger and she pulled me into the room where she slept. And I knew it was her bedroom because she pointed to a My Little Pony poster, but that exact moment, I looked down on the floor where her feet were and I saw the moldy mattress that she slept on. When I tell people that story, mm. they have cortisol is now in your veins. And I, and I can't leave it. I got to tell you, I gave them a new roof. I want to let you know. I gave them a new roof. It was the first roof I ever gave. I didn't want to, but I couldn't not do it. That's what a story does. It, it allows you to assimilate because everybody in the roofing industry has walked into that house and smelt that mold. Mm -hmm. 
and, and knew there was no money to pay for it. And almost everybody that I know in this roofing industry also has said, yes, I'll donate a roof. Quietly, they don't talk about it, but they say yes because it's, it's almost like it's in our blood to, you know, whether they can pay for it or not, you know, when somebody needs something, who are we to say no? It's like, I was on an airplane one time. I swear to God, this was just like, I've told this story. I imagined this hypothesis. And then this happened. I was on my way to a Roofing Alliance conference in Florida. And there was a doctor on an airplane moment. I mean, all of a sudden there was a patient, there was a passenger next to us who started having what looked like a heart attack, losing control of his body. And, and I watched people look around in this fear and the pilot's voice contemplating what we're going to do. And I watched this man stand up, this doctor, and he had this British accent and he was so noble in the moment. And the other doctor got up and they assimilated and everybody fell in line and everybody fell in line. He, what was he going to say? No. But he, he got up and this, he stabilized this passion. We made an emergency stop in Albuquerque. We were late to our conference, but suddenly nobody cared. I watched this occur and, and it was powerful. And by the way, the guy wasn't a doctor. He was the medic. He was the dive medic at Pacific Aquarium for the animals. Mm. But in that moment, he stood up tall. And who was I in that moment in that home when I had the skill to patch this roof to not see if I could do that? And so I did, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to patch it. They needed a whole new roof, and so I got volunteers, and I had my first ever experience where culture starts being built by volunteering together with the recipients, with the donors, and that's when I started realizing that not only story matters, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize it back then, honest. I didn't figure out story mattered until recently. I didn't tell this story, but not only stories matter, I know today, but yeah. stories that matter to everybody. Stories that matter, like, you know, today we donate, we donate roofs formally. Mm. We've donated the last 98 roofs here in Orange County for Habitat for Humanity. $1.5 million in roofing along with Eagle Tile. I feel like that speaks to the culture of you've built it in from the beginning, some, some form of helping people. I found, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day, and they were talking about, should you use charity and marketing? This is a fellow marketer, and we're cynical. We're, we're cynical and we feel like maybe if you're using it, it devalues it a little bit. And I felt, and I, I basically I talked about, it, I'm like, it still gets done. And my thing is, is not, it not only still gets done, it doesn't matter. Like for you, your, your motives matter, but for the person getting it, unless you're shining a, a camera in their face, it, you know, they're getting something done and it's a beautiful thing. And the other thing is, sorry, I just want to note, like, it's really good for your team and it's really good for the people in the company that, that, and that's the reason I feel it's more motivating to me because I know my team is going to be here a little bit longer because they're at a company that does stuff like that. Well, it's, 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 I, it's, it's not easy to talk about. In fact, 98% of the CEOs in this country uh, are not comfortable talking about it for good reason, because it's not well trodden. However, I've spent the last 10 years learning how to talk about it, so I'm comfortable and I do understand it, and what we call it is cause marketing. And what it really is, is it's, it's about making sure that every time you open your mouth, you're not just loading data on people that their brains can't assimilate, mm -hmm. you know, maybe one data point. If you tie it to a story, it's literally always opening your mouth mm -hmm. to, to make a story that matters. And if yeah. you want to have an effect in the world, then let your team, I'll tell it this way, Antis Roofing donates all these roofs. We don't, we do it for something that we had to learn. We do it because for our, what it does to our team. The national attrition rate in roofing companies, I've been on the board, I know these stats, is 54%. 54% of the people working at any giving roofing company across the country average will leave. Antis Roofing has held steadily close to a 90% retention rate. Can you imagine what that saves you? Read the studies on what it costs to to replace one employee. Yeah. What does it matter on the edge detail like of that 30% of their, their sa annual salary at least or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And if people knew that, they'd probably do a little bit more work to retain and maybe, maybe hire people better too, but. Today's episode is brought to you by Sales Transformation Group, the number one sales and transformation platform in the construction industry. If you're looking for new ways to professionalize your sales force and generate more profits for your business, find out more at salestransformationgroup.com slash hook agency. Well, we also talked, you mentioned, you know, best of success. And one of the reasons we spoke there is the roofing industry has come together in a big way. 
Wait, wait, wait. Before I tell the story about Ronald McDonald House, which is why I wear these socks. And I'll, I'll explain that. But somebody's in the room taking pictures. And this is so – Bobby, come in screen right now. I know you can't hear, but put your face right here where my hand is. Can you do – this is Bobby Przyski. What's up, Bobby? Say your last name. Uh, Prabilski. Prabilski. I'm sorry. He has one vowel and 11 consonants. You can't blame yeah. me. But I love Bobby. Bobby, Bobby is our – our visual storyteller, he created this poster because he understands that, that the human brain can't assimilate. But he understands that not only everything that I talk about, saying things positively, having stories in your message, using inclusivity, you know, he does, says it all in this concept of being a visual storyteller. So, Bobby, if you can, in like one or two sentence, sentences, say, what is it that you, what is your job here and what does it mean to be a visual storyteller? Um, so, my job at Antis, my. <laughs> My job at Antis is to take the stories of what we do every day, which is keeping families safe and dry throughout the community, and sharing it with words, but also in a way that people can digest mm. uh, without needing to read a single word. That's amazing. I love that. That's, that's incredible. I wish more roofing companies had this. Now, I'd like you to stay, but you better go because we won't be able to jockey questions. I'm, I'm going to grab you, bro. all my life. Thank you, sir. Um, Tim, appreciate you, bro. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Thanks, Bobby. I knew that would be more exciting because that's actually, you know, having that, him yeah, come that, in. That's a very he, specific He knows his example. job. Yeah. And in fact, you'll, if, you, if you follow Antis, and I recommend you to follow us on all the channels. I'm only active on LinkedIn, but Bobby does all the other channels. You'll notice that our stories are, are – they, they, uh, both of our stories align under keeping families safe and dry. And sometimes Bobby retells uh, the story that I'm telling. But but Bobby uh, is good at listening to the voices of those around us and creating a company mm. voice that's slightly different than mine, but yeah. both under the message of, of doing great things uh, to keep families safe and dry. So it's a powerful, yeah. it's when you use these metaphors of storytelling, um, we, uh, we actually have a storytelling coach that we can get to later. And, and he's not only taught me for seven years, now he's teaching our sales and our marketing Tell and us all of our Tell stories and why we're here in lineup. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, well, well, to tell you about that, I have to tell you that I'm really into discovering what fulfills me. Like if you want to be a good leader and you want to be happy, you better, you know, meditate or, or do a gratitude list or do those things that fulfill you. And so I, I, I'm really big into assessments. Like when I did the disc assessment for the first time, I found out I was a high I, which means I want everyone to like me. I was such a relief that I found out why I was that way. Now I, now I don't, I forgave myself. So I went to the Imperative Purpose Lab in Seattle to discover what fulfills me, a really deep four day dive. I didn't really want to go, but I wanted the outcome. And it was a pretty deep dive. And there was this one person that was in my pod and her name was Tara. And Tara was the CEO for Fathom Cruise Lines, one of the carnival fleets. And, and, and I remember when I discovered what it is that fulfills me, which is this, to ignite passion in others for good, I learned that I needed to speak more and teach less, mentor Ooh. close up, close less. And, 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 but then I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do because I was getting all these speaking, all the opportunities to speak and even speaking to my own people. Sometimes I wasn't heard. And then I said, Tara, I need a speech coach so I can be heard. And she goes, Charles, you don't need a speech coach. You need a storytelling coach. Mm. I'm thinking, I'm picturing like an old gold tooth, you know, 49er, like, well, Sonny, sit by the campfire. <laughs> That's not yeah. at all what I discovered. And she introduced me to Jay Golden. And he wasn't living in Alaska in the gold mines. He was living in Silicon Valley, you know, um, consulting people, companies like Kayak, like how to tell their story. And, and, he, and he's the world's most authority on retellable stories. You know, that, that you know, stop. He doesn't say this. I exaggerate his point with a sweeping statement like stop wasting people's time with dropping names and with data that they won't be able to remember all of it. Instead, yeah. show them this life changing experience through story like yeah. this peril that suddenly turned to an opportunity that might, if you present it in the right way to this audience, could maybe be life changing yeah. that they could see themselves forever higher. That's what Jay Golden taught me. And since then, I've been heard. Yeah. Since then, our, our brand is relevant. Since then, our, our people realize that every nail matters. And there's 200,000 parts on the average roof that we install. And that's why roofs don't last a full warranty. You know, we look at a roof fails in 15 years. We pull it up. They put the nail in too far. It fails in eight years. They didn't put the nail in far enough. I mean, when you realize that every nail matters, it's a deep concept in construction. It's an even deeper concept 
in community. And I think that's what happens is we start to cross over into this magic territory where people really put purpose. And so it helps every part of the company and also it helps the trade. When, you know, I, I gotta tell this story, you know, why wear these socks? And it's, I just told it on stage today at Nash, this Nash, I'm sorry, Association for Fundraising Professionals to a bunch of fundraisers for nonprofits and CEOs that give. And, you know, and that's the story of why I wear these socks and I, why I've worn them for so long and why we've worn them on several campaigns to raise money for Ronald McDonald House. And it's because eight years ago, a healthy pregnancy of my wife uh, and twins ended with preeclampsia and the Ooh. twins coming out early and we were at Children's Hospital Mission Viejo Chalk NICU. And, and, and we learned right away when we came into the hospital by the doctors and nurses at Chalk and they said, Charles and Don, there's no exact magic formulas, but we've learned this. When children are born premature, if you can come in twice a day and pull your shirts off and lay them down on your naked chest for two hours twice a day, that it will give them the best chance to heal. And so, yeah. you know, we came in every day and we did that with Charlie and Gracie. And it was, and it went from, you know, happy pregnancy to long rides to the hospital. Yeah. And one day I was going from work and I was coming in and I had, it was a second afternoon appointment and I, and Dawn was already there and I was late. And I was late because I had chronic heartburn. It was so bad that there's no way I was going to be able to lay down and I knew it. But when I walked in that day, I noticed Ronald McDonald House station and Ronald McDonald House had been there the two weeks I've been going in there. I always ignored them and they'd say, hey, have a coffee, have a bed, sleep here. You can use your computers. And I said, look, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to talk. And I didn't want to talk to them. But this one day when I came in, when I had chronic heartburn, I looked down and nobody was there. And I saw this little Green Valley Nature granola bar. That, that, you know, that one they've made since the 80s. I, I stole it with no intention to pay them back. And I, I don't remember anything else that day, except about an hour and a half later, I have this really clear memory of laying down in chalk NICU mission with my shirt off and Charlie's asleep on my chest and I have no heartburn. You know, and it's like, it's like I didn't get it then, but that was looking back when I started to get like why Ronald McDonald House is there. It keeps us close to our sick kids. And I, when I tell that story, I got to tell you, people relate in my company because we all have family or friends with sick kids and we've needed them to be close so they could heal, mm -hmm. whether with cancer or premature. And I found that it was really. And so when Ronald McDonald House came by and, and they said, hey, how you doing? I was like immediately said, how's your roof? Because we had already been donating all the habitat roofs for the last 12 years. And so uh, they said, well, yeah, we, could, we, have a, we have a leak here. So I discovered that Antis Roofing could make a big impact at the place that impacted my family by keeping families not only close, but safe, dry, and close when they needed it the most. And that became such a powerful story that I told it to the Roofing Alliance, to the 70 governors of the, of the fund of the National Roofing Contractors Association that does so much in philanthropy. And ever since that day, we've adopted every roof on every Ronald McDonald house in the US, over 200 roofing companies, all members of the NRCA, primarily led by the Roofing Alliance, which is the philanthropy arm of the NRCA. And, and it's like, so what happens when you start telling your real stories to people that are your stakeholders, like everybody in the roofing and supply chain, we're all, we have so much in common. And so when we tell our stories together, that has power. And I gotta say, everybody's benefiting. Ronald McDonald House, now they're, each home doesn't have to fundraise for yeah. roofing anymore. Roofers, you want at least five solid lead gen tactics building chemistry. Let's say you have door knocking, referral systems, job site branding, and you add in aggressive SEO, paid ads, and boom! Mmm, smells like more leads. Hookagency.com. I want to now and look at our company. Sorry. No, I, I get excited. You must have you must have studied marketing before getting into storytelling or something like that, or did you just learn marketing? Because the three main factors, like I think a lot about marketing, right? You talk about like failure or like pain, right? And we all failed. And then also avoiding failure is a big thing in marketing. Like we all, we want to help a homeowner or whoever um, avoid pain by working with a, a trusted mm -hmm. provider, right? And then you yeah. talk about story. Like you said not to go into data, but the data supports that story helps people remember things more. And then also that humor so you talk about funny stories and humor also increases memory. And I like, I like that you're not only talking about it in marketing, which I just want to like say the data is 
does really support this idea that both of those things increase Absolutely. memory. But I also want to say like, you're marketing internally at your company. And I know that people know this, but I just want to say it out loud. And it really sounds like you, you, you've both, you've gotten onto this idea, but you're also like, you're using storytelling and like almost branding internally to the every nail matters thing to help your people remember stuff. And I think about that a lot. Like I brand. I call that the inside. I'm sorry. I call that the insides matching the outside. Yes. Your insides got to match your outside. Oh, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't used to be that way. I started in philanthropy. It was more of an outside job. It was more work for everybody. It was disconnected yeah. until I told them that story of the moldy mattress. And mm -hmm. then they understood why. And then the other thing was I started listening to their stories mm. and we started to become together and why we do things but yes it's exactly as you say it's i mean i'm, I'm sorry i don't know i, I kind of cut you off no, there. no, i just want to talk about that idea of internal branding and then also internal storytelling like uh how could people get started on a little bit more storytelling because you had this coach right can you give us a couple like pointers that you got from them that obviously you've given some of them but you have any other like tips for people to get started with this like if they're a company, owner, yeah. let's say they're at like two million and they're trying to go to ten, and they're tr trying to incorporate some of these top, these like tips. Well, I think that what is what if the, I'm really speaking to owners or those people that really take ownership, at least in their sales, where yes. you're usually you're I'm talking to owners for sure. Stories. Yeah, I think it's important that you tell uh, it has to be real. So Ronald McDonald House is an easy example. That's my real story. It's, it's cr I'm credible without even trying because it's such a heartfelt real story, but. But the, what is it that I do in roofing? What is my unique story? And that is very much like when, you know, I didn't know what marketing was when I started my company. My first marketing message looking back was, give me the leak that no one else can solve and I'll fix it for mm -hmm. free. That was all I knew as marketing, you know. And so, so I learned through that to tell these stories. And like, like a story for me, in addition to giving away a roof, it's important I tell the story of like, I had told that to a property manager. Next thing you know, I'm hanging on the fourth story of a six story condo in Redondo Beach on a bosom chair. I'm not feeling safe, but I had told them, give me the leak that no one else could solve. And then suddenly I'm hanging over a roof because there was a 10 year leak nobody could solve. And I'm thinking, wow. And I gotta tell you, I had, a, I had a Makita saw. I had cut and tethered 10 pieces of siding to open up this patch. Of, of wall where I could find this. And I, I, again, I was more afraid of failing than falling. And, and I had exhausted all my tethers. I had cut that last piece. I'd clipped it off. And I thought, I, what am I doing? Can I make it in a company? At that exact moment, I looked down and I saw right at that last piece of siding, there was a little piece of white. I started picking at it. It was mold. I found rotted paper, rotten drywall. And then under that was a old 20 years ago nail that somebody had driven through a copper pipe. Huh. It wasn't even from rain. It wasn't yeah. even from rain, but I'd found it. And in that moment, I was as high as I was 40 feet up attached to that condo. And I knew we got something here. We can sell this. We can keep, we can keep people safe and we can keep them dry. And yeah. that's, that's a story that I need to tell because that's my story. So what is it that you did? did what is it the thing that you love about this profession that we do you need to tell a real story with that and and then when you tell a story i'll give you a little expression on that but if you can tie cause into it mm -hmm. it's gonna have 10 times the impact yeah. it'll be retold and retold and retold and retold but when you tell the story it's really important that you when you tell it you give them that dark feeling where their bodies their brains amygdala squirts cortisol you can't leave them there very long. Once I told you about the mattress, I had to let you know I replaced it. I got to give you the oxytocin. So I got to let you know I replaced it. I got to tell you something. If you tell a story too long and you leave them in the pain, yeah. not only will they shut you out for that story, as a sales professional, you need to know they're going to actually shut you out forever based on the fact that you gave them a tell that you're all cortisol. This is all subconscious behavior. They're mm -hmm. not knowing this is occurring. So yeah. when, you know, everything should be told in story. Yes, data is important. I make sweeping statements that say you need data points, but you can't support it the, the way that they can believe it mm -hmm. without the story that holds it together. And yeah. so there's one way, you know, Jay Golden, my storytelling coach, talks about take, you got to take people into a deep, deep, dark cave and then show them the change and bring them out. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, I look at it like this. It's a point, like I tell that story of going into that first home oftentimes as if I'm looking through my eyes knocking on the door, but sometimes I make sure I tell it as if I'm a drone on the wall from that angle. It mm -hmm. sounds crazy, but imagine yourself telling the story from a slightly different point of view mm -hmm. or telling 
the story from um, with a different reason you're telling it, maybe to a slightly different audience. Yeah. And, and when you start to break down your stories, then you start to have magic. But there's one more thing I got to tell you. Those of you who have a marketing message out there, those of you who are being heard in the world, maybe you've figured out your story before. Whatever your story was three years ago, it's old, it's dated, it's no longer relevant. Mm. You need to tell your story in today's eyes because all of the fears and hopes of people have shifted entirely. Authenticity is something that's completely different in the way it's perceived. There's a, there's a, there's a feeling of a lack of authenticity out there and you yeah. need real stories with vulnerability so you're believed inside your company and out. Mm. And it's critically important. Oh man, this is this is a good talk. This is a good uh, conversation. I feel like I've gotten like enough value, even if it wasn't going on a podcast. So, um, anything you like want to drive people to at the end here? Oh, well, I mean, I would love I, I I love our industry, the power we have together. I've learned that if I share exactly what's going on in my market with what's going on over there, that's the way I tell a story. That's the last advice I'd say. Tell the story with real vulnerability. Um, not, don't make yourself this big hero. Tell it like it really is. So if somebody in Florida or somebody in, 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 in Minnesota can emulate and maybe try what you're doing, otherwise, why are you wasting people's time dropping the name or telling the story? Yeah. Um, and, but, I, but I would say, because I'm like this, and there's so many of us like this, we are a powerful force together. So attach yourself to me and our friends on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. You follow us too. Let's stay together because together we're a powerful voice. Yeah. You know, I, I, and by the way, I'll probably be announcing a storytelling class for CEOs of roofing uh, through Jay Golden. We just did one for CEOs of Orange County and it was very successful and, and I'll support that. I'll be in that and I'll be sharing uh, my deepest insights on, on, on kind of what goes on behind the scenes and why it's made a complete difference in my life to tell stories, to not waste my time doing anything but telling stories that really matter to my team and to the community. So Amazing. And uh, AntisRoofing.com. Um, Antis, is it Antis Roofing all over social? Uh, and just riffing, yeah. Yeah, it's easy to find. Awesome. And then the podcast is put on by hookagency.com, Hook Agency, all over social. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, thank you for joining us, Charles. Thanks, Tim. Great times. Ah, that was good stuff. I'm all fired up now. Yeah, I mean, too.